Right. Again, this is part, and this is somebody using largelots.org. I was in a coffee shop. Go back to the photo. Um, and um, she's like, oh, wow, i got to show this to my mother because she went on to the website and just kind of like gave up. Right. So uh, this is somebody who was going to show it to her mother when she uh, went home. And so she was like grinning the whole time. She's like, oh, my God, this is so easy. We can get this done. Right. So if you go back to uh, large lots, uh, this is done under the context of this um, program, this initiative, this thing called Open Government for the Rest of Us. Uh, sponsored by LISC Chicago. The idea is what does open government look like in the neighborhoods, right? So this was an idea, and this is like the 100th hack night. Yeah. This was an idea that came from the neighborhood, right? We knew who to talk to, right? Did it make, acted on it. It wasn't a volunteer thing, right? So it was like a, a, a contract, right? Because I think you have to support development and innovation, right? And so uh, I think this is like an interesting maturation of the open government movement in Chicago where you have communities and again you know yes teamwork came up with this idea but we vetted it with residents first I went around hey you know you own property have you been to the website yes you need to be easier yeah would you like to be able to type in your address and get a lot that way oh yeah that'd be a lot easier right so we vetted the idea right so this wasn't just oh let's build a map this is built to specification based off of our uh, feedback from residents that we talked to right yes no, my question is, I know you said the deadline is April 21st and it's supposed to open up again. When it's supposed to open up and is it going to open back up, would it be the same format as it's going now? Yeah, I mean, we've never done anything like this. And we've, uh, Jeannie, who's getting all this, has like fielded over 400 calls and people are walking the office. So um, we, we tend to, yeah. I mean, I think um, we are relying on the community groups to kind of get the word out and do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we just want to see what we're getting and what the applications look like. And then we need to take a program ordinance to city council that will even make it easier going forward. So we haven't even, this is all in the pilot place. But yeah, I don't, I, I expect that we will. And we've all, already been asked about having it in other parts of the city, uh -huh. um, which, you, you know, there are other parts of the city that have the same number of green uh, city on lots in it. So I think we will be looking at that, but we're just trying to figure out how to process all this stuff right now. But yeah, I think so. So again, remember, Inglewood is at the forefront of innovation. <laughs> <laughs> right. There you go. Right. And, um, and again, this is like, I would call this open government with a capital O, capital D, because the program itself was because of an open process of community planning. Residents stood up, work closely with the city to pilot a program that may well be a program that's citywide. We don't know, right? But we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, Kathy, it's Patrick Barry. Oh, yes, uh, Patrick. How many applications are you, are you getting applications? Oh, yeah, we have about 120 so far um, that are filled out. So we've had a lot. I mean, this is great, but there are a lot of people um, to which I just walk in, and we've had to help some of them fill out the applications. But yeah, we have 120 that we have not been completed. It was 69 a week ago. Yeah, I know. I'm telling you. Yes. See people like, this is like, oh my god, that's all they're doing. Genie and Meg, that's all they're doing. So will the city collect property tax on them? Once well, yeah, people will be responsible for the property taxes, just like you would with any property. Um, and they'll have, they can only build what's allowed by zoning. And uh, they can sell it in five years. Is there any information? I know you linked off to the site that had the property tax information, but if the government's not paying themselves, is there any way that the residents have an idea if I'm going to buy this lot? What am I expecting to right. pay? Right. We get that question a lot. And I mean, it's going to be definitely less than whatever you're paying already because you have a house. So whatever your property taxes are, which they should have a good idea of, it's going to be, I don't know, probably 60% less because I think vacant land is assessed maybe at 40% or something. And also these lots are going to be individual, so you're not necessarily adding them to your property. So it just should be assessed like the county does this to figure out what the land is. So it should be assessed as I don't know vacant land. So you could actually figure it out pretty easily. You see the tax and deed history part, yeah. Yeah. linking to actually looking at a few vacant lots that are privately owned and seeing how many taxes tend yeah. to come out of those. That'd be a nice way to figure out because that is yeah. a question that people don't know. Like, what is it? Well, and that's how you could do it: is you look at well, who's paying who's paying taxes on yeah. vacant land? Right. There. Comparable land. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any speculative numbers around? If these lots were to go into the possession of Inglewood residents, how much tax revenue would the city would be bringing? No, we haven't. We haven't done. We don't. We can't answer that question. And if we can answer that question, then we could do that. But it would be interesting to see after we get these deeds transferred and how this process works, right? Because we did see, you know, the different variations of this kind of program have gone around the country, but it's not clear 
if it's kind of like two owners on the block, I think there's a difference if it's people that already own property on the block and how they're going to take care of it versus people that come in and they're trying to buy something up or buying houses for a dollar. So I think that, that there's a lot of variations. This one seems to be pretty solid because these people that are coming in own property and a lot of them are already taking care of this land. And I think Jeannie was saying that uh, a majority of applications that you receive, mm -hmm. the city has seen before. They yes. just weren't eligible under existing policy. Right. I mean, we were when we were out in the fields, like you know, a woman's got one lot as a garden and she wanted to expand it, but you know, we couldn't do that. And it's like she's already expanded the garden. Why would we not do that? Because it was just one program idea. So now we've expanded that. But this, what this does, the program lowers the barrier of entry for these lots to yeah, enter really the tax rolls, right? So, what percentage of Englewood land is city owned? Um, well, in general, city-owned vacant land uh, is about a third city-owned, we think, a third tax delinquent, which means we don't own it, the county's out there, and maybe a third private. And I think we have, I think there's 5,000? About 4,000 on 4, this 4,000 on this map? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, there's, so there's twice as many vacant land lots, at least in England, that you see on this map. How did the city come to own it? A lot of this is through demolition of housing. And some of it probably through tax delinquency. There was a time when we were picking up a lot from the county. The city could get it easier, um, like a whole bunch of properties. But mostly through um, demolition of housing. There was a lot of frame housing here. And so that, if the city demolished it, then that's where you get a lien. And then we, we came to tax. So there's two main ways it's happened. One is you stop paying your taxes, and then the county has a legal right at some point to take over the property. And correct me if I screw this up. No, that's right. Um, in this state, we do. They, the county doesn't really want to sit on that because they don't really have the money to market the properties. So we have something that's basically legalized loan charging called a tax sale, where they uh, they auction your debt to the city. So I owe the city eighty thousand dollars in in property taxes I haven't paid. My property is worth ten thousand. We're gonna sell it to somebody, and then they can go metaphorically break their kneecaps to get the money back. Um, the way the city, the demolition process is, there's a thing called the building code where you have to not have your frame house fall on people. That's not good. We have laws against that. And those laws are local laws or city laws. And so the city has a whole department of buildings that goes around and actually inspects properties to make sure stuff is up to code. If it isn't, they can initiate a process where at the end they can demolish it, especially if it's abandoned, which is what a lot of these laws are. People just walked away from them and there's no clear ownership. Right. right, and there's two tax sales. There's one where people make money, so tax buyers make money on property they think they're going to get money off of the person who didn't pay the taxes. And then there's a scavenger sale where people have really walked away, and that's when the city picked up more through the tax sale because the you're not you can you could have bid on somebody at the tax sale and you would have been having yourself a vacant lot. Uh, yeah, what in what cities and what programs are you most similar to? Well, the one that I was most similar recently was Detroit. I had gone to Detroit last May, and there had been an instance where um, we had met with some community groups, and a lot of them were upset because the city of Detroit, which you know had some problems with their government not being functional, um, some a resident of Detroit came in and wanted to buy like 15,000 vacant lots. He eventually did buy them, and it cost him about a half a million dollars because he had to do all of the legal work, and. The community groups were really upset about that because they had wanted to buy you know, them themselves, but because they couldn't manage this program, because uh, they didn't have staff to manage this program, they couldn't make those individual transactions. So it was a lot easier for somebody with money to come in and buy all the property in their neighborhood if they were not happy, um, and not be able to sell it to all these, you know, to all the individual owners. So that's one of the most recently I was I've heard about. So do you think this program is going to avoid that? Well, we already did because the residents did not want a lot of outside people coming in to buy the land. They were like, when we showed them, oh, they, they liked the program because it was targeted to them. And then they further targeted to the, the owners on the block. So that they, anybody, on, they felt comfortable, anybody on my block, I, they can buy that land. But I don't want somebody else coming in and buying that land. And it's not like you can't, you can't, but not for a dollar. I'm sorry if this seems daft, but why is that why they didn't want churches? Is that you said that that well, was? Well, there's a lot I mean, of uh, churches in the neighborhood. And so the residents yeah. said. Um, we all get along with each other. I don't know. They just it's like. No, it's so also the residents tax say, it's like tax. It's oh yeah, it's not also tax. This, this is about getting property. Yeah, this is about getting properties on the tax roll. Oh right. right. So that's oh, also that's it. Yeah, non profit organizations who are probably like pay taxes. Churches for some reason get exempt very easily. So it's it's, it's just. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's, that's what 
It's about taxes. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm just I'm curious. Is, was there any discussion about the effect of larger plots of land in the neighborhood? So if, if all these neighbors could kind of convert to larger plots of land, what the long-term effects would be of that? Well, yeah, I mean, that's partly why we did it. So we started calling it like Estates of Inglewood. And, so, and earlier in the process, some other people are talking about this this geography and Naperville are sort of, uh, let's say Naperville, or I don't know, my shop or something, are the same physical geography and have the same density, but they look different because, you know, they have big lots in Schaumburg. Why don't you have big lots here? Now, is, you know, do we need to densify this neighborhood? The residents who buy these lots can sell those and make money in the future if there's a market. Right now, there's not a market. So this positions them to own the property. And if they want to sell it, they can sell it. If they don't, they get a large lot. We are not worried about not having enough space for housing housing right now. Well, so kind of a follow-up then, is there any concern that people will hold on to these lots and kind of leave them in their current state and that would really kind of lock in the neighborhood into the current kind of mode? Mm, no, not with the projection of you know needing no new residential housing units to 2040. And you could still do density along the commercial corridors. Another sort of planning concept out there in the city is that we have 700 miles of land zone for commercial. We only need 300 because we don't shop long strips. So you can always take the commercial land and you can always build up and you can always build density around transit. This gives you a certain type of housing mix in the neighborhoods. We did not do the higher to around the um, transit stations. We did not. That land there is not for a dollar because that is where we would see density. So along the front of Washington Park and around, you know, the Boulevard or uh, the Plaisance, you know, that's where you would want. That's where you'd probably see density first. And plus, we don't own all the land there. There's equally that much out there for other people to buy. So please come on down. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any restrictions on how long? People are supposed to have residence before they can purchase these. Like, no, you only oh, got a deed. Like, can I go out and buy sure, go ahead. tomorrow? If you suppose by yeah. yeah. twenty years. Well, sometime this year we're probably over it. But if you go buy a house there, then you're eligible. Sure. Did you ever consider including renters in the pool? And was there any? I think we that? did, but I think. Um, we just did not do renters. I think, oh, sorry. What we uh, were doing is encouraging people to talk to their landowners to buy the lot so the renters could use the land. So that's how we were, that's what we were talking about. But ultimately, that would have to get approved through the uh, city, I imagine, right? Through some sort of council proceeding? For what? To approve so that renters could buy it, because this was all. This was right, all. that would be a different program, and yeah. we just really didn't. Um, but yeah, we really wanted them to talk to their, get their landowners to buy their land. Little to buy it, yeah. Uh, have you made a, 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 a Do you have any plans to uh, expand uh, the map here uh, to other potential areas the city might be moving into? Just um, to show us the, the vacant lots in, the, in those areas so that maybe there could be some public, you know, public feedback to the city on which area to go. Do through. we plan to expand this map? Yeah. Well, since I didn't make it, I won't be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, um, I'm happy to talk about that. I mean, it seems like I said, we kind of did all the hard work yes. of making this master list of all vacant owned land, uh, city owned land in Chicago. Like we did it for the whole city. We just cut out the part for this program area. But I can tell you what that, I mean, that's going to look like Austin, East Garfield, West Garfield, North Lawndale, Roseland. Um, would look a lot like this. Okay. Um, and then you'll have some other stuff scattered around. But so yeah, you might. I mean, we've already been talking and have inquiries about why would you, why don't you do this in North Lawndale and Garfield and all sure. this stuff. Yeah. Not out of the question. Really? It's a very. It turned out to be very popular. It's a very overprescribed uh, program that we have. I mean, I think the only thing I want to consider is if, like this has a purpose, right? Which yeah. is to get right. Get, like there's a program behind it, right? I think it'd be useful to showcase that map. You could just do it, um, but. We're learning a lot just by people using this to see what's useful to know. So, um, but I'm all for taking a look at it. Well, and the other thing is we we're getting all these applications in, so it's it's good to know that you know we we're actively taking them. So even if you're we can't get everybody done the first of April, we'll have it again and we'll kind of complete this area. But if we don't have the capacity oh. to like take applications from somewhere else, it should be known that that's not ready to go yet, so people don't. Get frustrated. Yeah, I understand that, but I, I was impressed with what Desmond brought up about, you know, this is a result of a lot of community meeting. Right. So could we then take the result of that as technology 
and then engender a lot of other community discussion and community involvement in those other areas of Austin and Gar Garfield and, and whatnot. Well, I think even in this area, this is a, we've been talking about this, at this program for a group like Tim Englund and some of the other organizations, it's a very, uh, it's a lot easier to organize and do this because people then buy it than it is, oh, we need to build a grocery store, or we need to build a senior house, because that's all about, that's a whole other process. The you know, organization has to get financing and do all this stuff. Whereas here, they did this, they're working with their neighbors, and now their neighbors can come and take advantage, you know, they're sort of organizing their neighbors right. and getting lists of people who are now much more invested than, they already were invested, and now they're becoming more. So on the, the data processing side, how, how much processing do you do of those applications? Oh, we don't is, need there, is there anything on the technology side that could facilitate I'm that? sure there will be. Okay. Um, that's, we have to look and see what, we were just talking about that, what we could ship back over to like Teamwork Inglewood. Like for example, <laughs> the EDS, the Economic Disclosure Statements or stuff like that, I'm not sure. There's probably going to be people that haven't completed them. So there's probably going to be a lot of incomplete applications. Yeah. Oh, well, how much, how much data processing is done? I mean, do well, we don't, well yeah, does anybody want to input addresses and names of applicants? Because that's what we got to do. Yeah. I mean, we have all these handwritten applications right now. Okay, it'd be great if Jeannie didn't have to put those all into an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. I mean, so that's yeah. right now what we're doing. One thought we had while we were working on this, but we just decided we didn't have time to do, was there's ways you could automatically like, <coughs> like take that application form and then pre-populate it with data. Like I clicked on this lot, I've already got some information I want to pluck off of there, and we could potentially like generate a PDF with that stuff already filled out. Um, but that was just something that was just like would we'll take take a little bit more time than we had to get up. Or digitize it all together. I mean, yeah. web forms are pretty common nowadays, right? Yeah. So you can imagine oh, right. you can imagine a, a, an online version that would give them the spreadsheet already. Yeah, and let you process it that way. Yeah, it'd be all about working. I don't know if that, uh, obviously yeah. there's. Well, I think there's a lot of applicants that are not. You know, they're going to do a handwritten application. Totally, that's right. I mean, that's the, a lot of people here. But it's not what are we going to do with those handwritten applications and how we get that data in? Because we we'll want a map. Like, okay, where are those 120 people? Where are they in this area? You know, mm -hmm. what's going? Are they clustering in a certain area because they're by rage or you know something else? We we will have to see once we get that data input. Is there any way to check the status of your application once it's... Submitted? I'm sorry, what? Can you check the status of an application once it's been submitted? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, we don't have any... No, that, that would be helpful. That would be a nice thing to know. If they could go on and check that out, sure. All great ideas. That's it. So, um, so again, it's a very new yeah. program, very new policy. It's almost like... I never have had this many people... Oh, just like, ANLEP has had like last year 70 total sales, right? Wow. So now we have 120 applications in what, three weeks? Fairly so good. it's a totally different scale for us to deal with. That's it. So again, largelots.org, an open government um, a tool uh, built with community, right? Of my important people, right? So that's, that's what it's all about. So that's when you think of large lots, think about that. Community driven policy, open data, community driven. Technology.